I am going to time myself. Okay, good. I didn't know whether it counted up or down, but I'm going to count it up. Um, I'm Rachel. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, this is my first time here, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm grateful to Larry for asking me. Um, I have a sponsor as a sponsor. I have a home group. I was going to say mostly. I mean, they're pretty regular, though, huh? Pretty regular. I sign my name. I write that down that it is my home group. It's on your sign sheet. And, um, and I'm happy to be a part of this program. I wanted to start by reading uh, just really briefly. Um, I guess since it's January, uh, the first step is getting talked about a lot. It's also just been on my mind um, a lot. Uh, so first, I'm just going to read briefly from page 30, uh, just the beginning of more about alcoholism. Uh, most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. We know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. <clears throat> All of us felt at times that we were regaining control, but such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by still less control which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. Over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. And I um, wanted to read a little something, but we'll see where I get on time. Uh, this is not my first time in the program. That was in 2015, I was 23, and I made a real cute attempt. Um, I was sincere in arriving. Um, <laughs> I, I was, I was scared. Uh, I was scaring myself on a regular basis. Um, I knew a friend who was in the program and I reached out to her after, um, my blackouts started to scare me and what I was doing during those blackouts became, um, troubling. And I think that's probably familiar to a lot of people in here. And I had been making the promises we all do about how much or how often or what kind of booze I was going to drink. And I, I, was, I couldn't believe that I couldn't keep to a one, even though I worked six days a week, nine to five at a bar, and I drank all night in bars. And uh, being surrounded by bar people, they'd always say, well, you're 23. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing right now. <laughs> but I didn't know how to tell them, like, I'm doing it all alone. Like, other 23-year-olds might be out with their friends and have one too many or go to a, I don't know, I don't know what other people were doing, but what I was doing, I could tell this isn't normal. Drinking alone by myself in bars, I picked a bar that closed at midnight so I would get home earlier. But I went there so often they started letting me stay late. It just became, <laughs> it, it just wasn't, it wasn't right and I, and I was terrified. And I went to um, a meeting in West Seattle called Titanic and I said, I'm Rachel, I'm an alcoholic and I is saw. And then I went, it was an open meeting and I went back the next week and I said, it was my friend. I said, my name is Rachel and, and I'm a guest. And they went, all right, <laughs> suspicious. Um, but I, I stuck around for a year. I stayed sober for that year. I went to meetings every day, at least one. Um, I loved fellowship, like I kind of alluded to, I'm a bar drinker. Um, so hanging out with alcoholics all night long was perfectly fine by me. Um, and I loved the program, but I didn't, uh, I didn't commit to a sponsor. I would read the book, but I didn't work the steps. It was um, an intellectual exercise. I can, I like those. Uh, um, so that's what I was doing. And, but I was onto something, I was clever. Your drinking's not normal, you're pretty upset. And um, I listened to the people around me and I reaped the benefits of sobriety really, really quickly. I went back to school, I remodeled my house. I found some, I did, I was, I was happy and busy and like productive. Um, but I didn't work the steps and not even, I realize now, step one, uh, which is the one they tell us we have to work continuously and completely. Um, so I went back out and it's funny, a friend of mine shared last night at a meeting, he's recently returned to the program after the stint out. And um, I hadn't realized this until he said it about his own experience. When I went out, I knew I'd be back. Like I, 
I knew enough to know, well, this probably isn't going to go well, but now I know where to go. I know people who are sober. I have an understanding of the program and I'll be back if this doesn't work out. It is not, it was, it was not that easy. Um, and I stand before you today, like astounded. I've got eight months now, which a inpatient treatment more than eight months ago, but, um, just last year, I'm astounded at what a progressive illness this really is. That's why I chose that passage. Um, I was out for five years. I'm 29 now. I'm young. Um, this disease took me to depths I didn't know at 23 when I entered were possible. Like I said, I listened to other people, but obviously I needed to do it for me. I needed to gather my own data. <laughs> and um, that data is conclusive that I'm an alcoholic. And now that I understand what that means, um, what did that passage just say there? Uh, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, like in every facet. Um, I did go to meetings, like in those first two years I was out, I, uh, I get it still going. Uh, <laughs> I, I did go a couple times, like just desperate, sad, you know, what else am I going to do? And I would cry, just at, they'd read how it works and I'd cry. That is how it works. And um, <laughs> I go, you know, and so women would approach me and if you need to talk to anyone, like, okay. But I, I couldn't, I couldn't get there. So I kept drinking and uh, I'm a bar drinker. So uh, I shared just on, on uh, Thursday that I had a therapist tell me like, I can't even tell if you're more addicted to alcohol or the bar. And I don't know if he was a very good therapist, but he was really onto something. This community, I am. Um, one thing I understand now is that if I was a functioning alcoholic, it was only because I designed for myself a life that allowed for my drinking. Oh yeah, I'm functioning in this very strange existence around which only, I'm only, I only surround myself with people who drink like I do. I only take jobs in bars, um, which you, there's neither here nor there. I just, it wasn't working out. And I thought those bar people were, I thought it was family. What else did I say on Monday? I said, I, I don't know if you guys know who the comedian John Mulaney is, but uh, he's got some issues. But he, he had an intervention. Uh, he was talking about it on late night TV, though. My friends threw an intervention for me at my first thought. I was like, what a fun intervention. Like Fred Armisen and Bill Hader. Like, all these comedians I really like would have been there. <laughs> but my second thought was like, nobody did that for me. I was glaringly ill. Um, physically ill, mentally ill, desperate. Um, Nobody had an intervention for me, but why would they? Anyone who truly cared about me or would have recognized what was wrong, I had eliminated from my life. Um, so two years in, it's out of control. I'm dropping into meetings. Three years. Um, when I went to treatment last year, they talked about radical acceptance. And I was very sassy there. Because I told them, like, you can't tell me about radically accepted or radical acceptance, radically accepting anything, because I've radically accepted my fate as an alcoholic, which is to die as an alcoholic. That I've been throwing up bile every morning for two years, and I've just worked that into my morning routine. Like, that's, that's some pretty radical acceptance, you know? Like, I can't hold a pen and write my own name until I've had like, three vodkas. And like, so I just have three vodkas. Like, I'm accepting the facts of my circumstances and moving forward. And that was, I, I mean, same with surrender. You know, we talk about surrender in here, and I thought, I've totally got that. I've surrendered to the fact that I'm going to die at, like, 32, 33, if not sooner, and uh, my liver's going to fail, and it's going to be pretty ugly. And so, like, how much more surrendering could I do? Um, then I took myself to treatment, um, which is very out of character for me. Um... I don't, I don't totally subscribe to like the God shot idea um, in its most commonly used form, at least. Uh, but that would be the closest thing I've ever experienced to a God shot. So certainly it was not of myself that I made that decision, um, especially under those circumstances. I will say I did find a very nice primary care doctor who was like, so she was taken aback by me. She actually said, um, <laughs> her name's Dr. Boomgart. If anyone needs a primary care doctor, I highly recommend her. She's at Swedish and rented. But I came in for an eye infection and she looked at me and she saw that I was very ill. I mean, I was like swollen, like starting to turn yellow, 
was pretty apparent um, to everyone. <laughs> And she, she asked how much I was drinking. And at that point, like, why lie? What's she going to do? She's going to narc. <laughs> like, um, and I was scared. So I think I was just real honest. And uh, so she wanted to do some blood work. And before I left the office that day, she was like, you know, I'm wearing my mask. With COVID. I, uh, you could have been a model if you didn't drink so much. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> so she did my blood work. It was terrible. She said she'd never seen anything like that in a 29 year old. Um, so I went, I went to treatment and there they told me that I was almost beyond the level of their care, but I stuck it out. And, um, you know, I'll skip ahead because that's what happened. I, I went and I don't have any explanation for that. No one encouraged me to go. That's for sure. Um, those people were far out of my life. Um, but that leads to that. The other thing I really wanted to touch on was from page 25, which is, they're, well, 24 to 25, but I'm going to skip in the middle. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and hum humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without <clears throat> defense against the first drink. Skipping in the end. When this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, he has probably placed himself beyond human aid and unless locked up, may die or go permanently insane. These stark and ugly facts have been confirmed by legions of alcoholics throughout history, but for the grace of God, there would have been thousands more convincing demonstrations. So many want to stop, but cannot. And um, treatment didn't do it for me. I have eight months. I went to treatment a year ago. Uh, it did something for me. It gave me 30 days. I dried out. I got a medically supervised detox. Um, but finally doing step one is what did it is doing it for me on a daily basis. Um, I am not afraid of the delusion that I can go back to what I'm doing. In fact, I live with what I consider a very healthy fear of the first drink. Um, not, you know what, not so much of the first drink of the second. The first drink I'm building through this program a defense against. Um, but I know that after that first drink, um, I've initiated the phenomenon of craving and, um, I've set in motion a terrible series of events. Um, I'm so lucky to be standing in front of you here today. I'm so lucky I haven't seriously, permanently hurt anyone else. Um, I, uh, I can't go back. And um, I, when I was 23, it's like maybe one day I'll travel to Japan, of which I have no plans or even like dreams. And I was like, it would be rude if someone offered me sake in Japan. And I said, no, like that's where, that's how I was thinking. <laughs> so, which is, what, what, that's, that's nuts. <laughs> because now I understand um, how powerless I am over alcohol. And I have a growing understanding of my powerlessness over other things. And finally, that rather than being a scary fact is really, really the greatest relief in my life every day is to remind myself of my own powerlessness and lift that burden and know that but for the grace of God, there would have been thousands more and I'm beyond human aid. So through this program, I'm able to get in touch with whatever part of myself or the universe sent me to treatment last year. I need to find that in every day and wake up and choose, choose this program. And, um, and, and I am, and I, I plan to, you know, the other thing that used to bug me when people say, I go, keep coming back, it works. And there was always one or two people who go, stay. Oh my gosh. I, I do not want to keep coming back. Um, and plenty of, I, you know, we all say it. Like, you know, some people have been back out and come back. I don't like to hear, I don't have another recovery in me. Uh, I think that's a kind of a dangerous thing to hint at anyone in this room. But um, I mean, I would like to hold on to this recovery. I'd like to keep what I have today and keep growing through that. Um, coming back is too hard. And uh, you know, I live with that healthy fear, but but ultimately I'm, I'm fueled by gratitude that, uh, that I'm able to be here. Uh, but I almost, I almost wasn't, and a lot of people, a lot of people aren't. So I think we're all lucky to be here. And thanks, Larry, for asking me to talk. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>